Hi, I'm JC Cervantes, and I am so excited to be here today. I hope you are too. I have the incredible privilege of introducing you to the amazing Shannon Messenger, who is the author of the New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal best-selling Keeper of the Lost Cities series, which follows Sophie, a girl who discovers she's from another world that exists side by side with ours, and one that has given her amazing abilities. With over 2 million books in print, the next book in this magical blockbuster series, Unlocked, is coming this November. Hooray! I'm so, so excited. excited. I'm really even more excited for to be done writing it because I am down to the wire, but it looks so amazing seeing the, the cover out there. This is, by the way, this is the first time Sophie has gotten to be solo on the cover. So it's been so fun sort of watching her grow up on the covers and now becoming stronger and standing on her own. It's very exciting. But and it's a beautiful cover, like all of your covers. So congratulations. Thank you. But what's even more exciting is that I get to introduce everyone to you. Um, Jen, otherwise known as JC Cervantes, is the New York Times best-selling author of the Maya mythology-inspired Storm Runner series from Rick Riordan Presents, as well as Tortilla Sun. Her award-winning books have appeared on national lists, including the American Booksellers Association New Voices, Barnes & Noble Best Young Reader Books, and Amazon's Best Books of the Month. The Storm Runner series concludes Zane and his dog Rosie's adventures this September with the Shadow Crosser. And I am so excited because I love this series so much. And also, I'm so jealous that you actually are done. Like, you got to write the end <laughs> of your series. <laughs> What's that like, Jen? <laughs> it, well, it, it, well, I don't know. Never say never, Shen. <laughs> Oh, this is very true. I'm guessing, you know, I, I keep saying like when I write the last book, I'm going to sob like, you know, hysterically, but it's just, it'll be exciting, but it'll be bittersweet. So <laughs> you've spent so many years creating and crafting this world and these characters and this rich, complex villains and plots. And I mean, it's been your life. I know it's been with me since 2008 was when I had the idea. So like more than a decade, it's going to be so bizarre when it's actually wrapped up. <laughs> Not for a few more years, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to put you on the hot seat today. And um, I have some questions for you. And I think that viewers are going to be really excited to hear your answers. So are you ready to jump into this? I am. Okay. All right. I'll try and be gentle. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm on deadline. So, you know, we're dealing with deadline brain. <laughs> All right. All right. So. I have to start with the question I'm sure everyone here is thinking, and it's not a spoiler because we're all way too used to your endings <laughs> by now to not see this coming. So Shannon, um, why the cliffhangers? Do you just enjoy torturing your readers? Well, I mean, it's not not fun, <laughs> but um, it really just comes down to the fact that, as you know, with writing a series, you know, even though it gets broken down into individual books, you're really telling one long story. And so really there's no end until I get to the end, you know? And so I try to think of my endings more as game changers. I try to have it be that we sort of like the story starts on a certain plot thread and we do get some sort of arc and resolution on that plot thread, but then we get a glimpse of what's to come and we get this sort of game changer ending that gives you a clue of like where the story is going next and what's still left. And I do realize it's evil. <laughs> and I know my readers tell me all the time that like they throw their books across the room, which is make sure no one's around. They're thick books. Like that could be I dangerous. Know. <laughs> so, you know, but I fully support that. Like, you know, I, I love knowing that they're that invested in the story that I can provoke that kind of reaction, but I don't intend intentionally do it to torture them so yeah um, no absolutely. you're doing your job <laughs> I mean, you did a little bit of cliffhanger stuff right I feel like I remember there being some of that in in the storm runner right I'm not the only one guilty am I or no I, I mean there was there was more right let me just say this there was probably much more resolution um than your cliffhanger <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> well, you know, in my early books, in the early part of the series, we had more resolution too. As you get deeper and deeper into the story, it's just like, well, here we go. So if you get to book eight. <laughs> yeah. 
Awesome. Well, listen, I, um, I'm going to put you on the hot seat again. So it's, um, we're, maybe we should time you, but you, you get 10 more thinking about them to introduce the keeper of the Lost Cities series. Go. Only 10 words. You've seen how long my books are, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be difficult. Um, okay. Sophie is an elf and has to save the world. Oh my gosh, that was actually 10. I did it. That's <laughs> really good. Elf and save the world. <laughs> it is hard. You know, I don't think a lot of people realize, especially people who are not authors that are my life friends and family, how hard it is to do anything that's short. Like if you ask me to write a novella, a short story, that is so much harder than writing an entire novel. Economy of words is tough. So you did a great job. <laughs> Yay. I have Keeper ironically actually started as a short story. So we can see how good I am at short fiction. My 6,000 page series was supposed to be a short story. Go oh me. Gosh. That's amazing. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've heard you say that the published version of The Keeper of the Lost Cities is draft number 20. So this is a really great segue into what you um, are really kind of bridging from where we were. So I'm curious, what was it about the story that made you keep going through all of those revisions and not just abandon that idea that you really stuck with it? I mean, I'm kind of a stubborn person. So there was that. I was like, I will figure this out, you know, but um, it really, it, it came down to the characters. Like they just wouldn't leave me alone. Um, they, my characters are probably a little bit too real to me. They, they definitely sort of take over my brain. And that was what had happened. You know, that's how my short story turned into such a gigantic thing was I, I was actually writing the story from Fitz's point of view. It was just supposed to be this quick little story about him being an elf and meeting another little girl and realizing that she was an elf. And that was my brilliant end of the short story was, Sophie, you're an elf. <laughs> Don't you feel satisfied by that ending? Apparently I did cliffhangers even back then. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't stop thinking about that little girl and wondering what was going to happen to her and, and why she'd been hidden away from her world and what someone had planned for her and how that was all going to work. And it just, it just became this constant story that was in my head. It's kind of like, have you ever woken up from a dream that was really, really cool? And you're just so mad that you don't get to see where it went. You know, that was my brain with that story. So even though it was frustrating because I was learning how to write a book and it wasn't cooperating on the page and I was struggling to get it right and capture what it was that was in my brain, it wouldn't leave, you know, it just stayed there and, and insisted on being told no matter how many times I was like that's it I've done 15 drafts there's no more and then I'd start the 16th draft because I couldn't you know let that story go yeah well and you have such powerful beginnings one of the things that I love about the very 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 first book um I'm, I was born and raised in San Diego so of course that drew me in and I was very familiar with the setting and you just launch right into it I mean there is no let's get to know everybody it was just launch into the action. And I think that that's really powerful. And all of your beginnings do that. They just really jump right in, um, which is probably a good thing considering that you end on cliffhangers. So then it probably keeps your readers really happy. I think that's honestly kind of what happens when you do cliffhangers, which is yet another reason why I do them. Because otherwise, if you sort of wrap everything up and tie up all those strings, then the beginning of the book, you have to untie everything again. And so... I knew with a longer series that that could start getting kind of frustrating and repetitive if it was constantly tie everything up and then unravel it and then tie everything up and unravel it. So it, the other option is to just never tie anything up until the absolute end. I don't know if I've made the right decision, but here we are. <laughs> well, maybe I need to get, take some cues from you, Shannon. So I'll have to, I'll have to, uh, maybe take you out for a drink next time I am in California. Yeah, um, that we definitely need to do. <laughs> I'll get some good pointers from you. So and I'll get some from you. <laughs> I've also noticed that you're not afraid to let the villains win, which I love because I really love a great villain. Um, and you let bad things happen to your characters. So is that hard for you as a writer? I mean, it depends on the character. I I'm not necessarily sad when bad things happen to the villains for the most part. Um, but no, I mean, it's, I, I totally sit at my laptop crying like a baby um, when I'm having to do those things. But for me, 
I have to stay true to the story that I'm telling and I have to stay true to the characters. And I have very smart, very powerful villains that have been planning what they're doing for a very, very, very long time. And so to have them not succeed, to have it be sort of hapless and all fall apart every time, it just, it wouldn't be true to them and it wouldn't be accurate to the, to the world. And so sometimes they win and it's, it's not an easy thing as a writer, but I also think that it gets us a chance to really see my characters shine as they go through those adversities. I mean, I, I, the other side of the coin is I always get asked like, would you want to meet your characters? And the answer is probably no, because if they were real, they'd want to throw things at me because I let so many bad things happen to them. So as much as I love my characters, I'm not sure that they'd love me, but I stay true to them, even the villains. <laughs> of course. Well, and so you've given us some really great tidbits and, and kind of a, a glimpse into your mind and imagination about how you craft. But I'm sure that we have some fellow um, writers watching right now. What advice would you give to anyone who wants to be an author? And I know that that's a really big question, but if you could narrow that down to, what, what advice would you have wanted to hear before you launched into this career? And by the way, heads up, I'm going to throw this question back at you. So start thinking oh! of your answer <laughs> while I ramble. Um, you know, there are so many different pieces of advice that writers give, um, but one that I wish I had known um, was to not rush through the aspiring writer stage of being a writer. I was very focused on, I wanted to be a published author. I wanted to have my books on shelves. And this is exciting and amazing, but it will be there when you're ready. And it comes with a lot of things that are, you know, kind of stressful like deadlines <laughs> and reviews and sales numbers and all of these things that can really kind of make writing very very stressful and kind of sap your creativity and what you spend a lot of time doing when you're in the thick of that is trying to sort of recultivate your love of writing and sort of remember how you got here and how you did this because you know creativity on demand is not an easy thing and as i'm sure you know as a writer the deadline is the deadline and it doesn't matter if you're not feeling inspired you need to sit down and produce some words so what i find myself doing is sort of trying to remember shannon when she was just an aspiring writer and remember why i loved words and all those things but so much of that was me in a hurry to get published that i didn't really appreciate what i had and so that's sort of my advice that i give to writers is to really embrace that special time that you get when it's just you and your story and creativity and words and falling in love with writing, because that is a moment that it's so easy to not appreciate and realize just how special it is, but it is so special and you're gonna need it once you get to the next stage, you're going to need to remember why you love this and how to sort of get in that creative zone so the more you've done that now, and then it just also takes that pressure off yourself because you're gonna have plenty of pressure once you are a published author. So enjoy, you know, not having that kind of pressure. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with setting goals and being motivated, but also give yourself that relief to just really enjoy the process of learning how to write a book and, and you'll get published eventually. You don't have to be in the desperate rush <laughs> that I was. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. what I was going to say. Now you get to make me look not nearly as smart and, and, and wow us with a, a brilliant answer. <laughs> well, no pressure there at all. I don't know how brilliant it is, but I want to go back to what you said, because I think it's a really important element that we forget to talk about, which is you're so right because you never get that again. You never get that moment as a writer, an aspiring writer and before publication, because once that first book is published, at, at least for me, and you can tell me if this happened for you, I've never written again without an editor on my shoulder, without right. an agent on my shoulder, without readers on my shoulder, without teachers and librarians. And all of a sudden, all these other voices have entered my world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, I can never go back to that innocence of crafting a story with no voices, except for the characters and maybe mine. Just so pure creativity. It's such a special thing that you don't really, you never appreciate it when you're there. But once it's gone, you're just like, man, I miss that so much. Well, you're so right. And the only other thing that I would add is 
it's not necessarily writing advice. It's more life advice because I think that you have to have a certain level of, of for lack of a better word, armor um, as an author. And I always tell people, surround yourself with those who not only love you, but will support your dream and will really give you that sustenance that you need as you go through this process and on the days that you want to give up and you want to throw in the towel that you have at least one person in your life who tells you be stubborn you know go keep going don't give up because every single no is just one door closer to opening this yes so um, i that's I such great good. advice yeah. i i think that especially because i i, I might have been weird but for me when I first started writing, it sort of felt like this secret. I was sort of embarrassed to like tell people because they, they're, they're, sometimes you get that look of like, oh sure, you're gonna be a, a published author, you know, kind of thing. It, it feels like such a huge dream, you know? It feels like saying I'm gonna be a movie star or something like that, you know? And so I kept it very secret for a while. And I think I probably would have moved further faster if I had been open about it to people because every, everyone was incredibly supportive once I did finally tell them, so oh, I'm writing a book, you know, kind of thing. And so I think I know a lot of people same way that it just kind of, it feels like this thing that you almost are embarrassed to talk about, but there's nothing embarrassing about chasing a dream and there's nothing embarrassing about wanting to tell stories at all. It's an amazing job. Despite my whining about deadlines, it's best job ever. No complaints here. Well, a few. <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> Well, you know that um, there's no way that we're not going to talk about the shipping, right? Uh -oh. um, so did you always plan for the series to have a love triangle? No. In fact, I am not necessarily a huge fan of love triangles um, in stories. I mean, there are some that I enjoy, but I tend to get really frustrated a lot of times because love triangles are very, um, they tend to be written from the standpoint of the character realizing that they have these two options and just sort of being like, I don't know who I love. And I just want to yell at them like, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> but um, I don't feel like that's what I'm writing. I feel like as much as it can also be frustrating, Sophie sort of lives in this oblivion. Um, she, she grew up very insecure, you know, she could read minds and heard all of these thoughts that people didn't realize she could hear and she sort of internalized all of that and sort of thinks now that you know just because somebody is being nice to her she doesn't really know if they actually genuinely like her or not and so it really doesn't occur to her that she has these two options and it has just sort of become this thing that has grown and grown and grown and now I live in fear that someday on my gravestone it's going to say here lies Shannon Messenger murdered by team <laughs> um, but I mean it's also amazing to see that happening to see that my readers are that invested in the characters but it wasn't it certainly wasn't a plan honestly it also just came from the fact that that was kind of my experience growing up was that the same people never liked each other at the same time. It was always like there was the person you had a crush on and then they had a crush on somebody else and somebody else had a crush on them. And it was never like this neat little box of these people like each other and are together. It was always this big confusing triangle or square or mess of sorts. And so that's just kind of where it started in the very early books, it was sort of, there was the boy that Sophie liked, and then there was the boy that liked her, and then there was this sort of wild card that we couldn't tell, does he like her? Does he just like to annoy her? Does she like him? Does she just want to strangle him? We can't tell. And it's just sort of me staying true to the characters as the series has gone on, and now here I am. <laughs> The square became a triangle, and I live in constant fear of um, the teams. <laughs> so then I have to know, um, and I think everyone else wants to know, um, so is it team tits or team teeth? For me, you mean? Or, you know, no one believes me when I say this. They always think I'm just giving this as an answer, but I really, I, I am team Sophie, and I work very, very hard to not pick a team because I feel like I've read series where in my opinion sort of the final pairing felt more like it was what the author was wishing instead of what 
really was organic to the characters. And so I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure that I stay true to my characters. And so I do these like mental exercises with myself where if I start to find myself leaning a certain way, I'll like sit down and make a list of great things about the other boy. <laughs> and then if I find myself leaning toward that boy, then I'll make a list about the other ones. It also helps that I work with two editors and one is solidly Team Keefe, and the other is solidly Team Fitz. Oh my gosh! Um, the notes that I get sometimes in the book can be quite interesting. It can be like, no, she needs to tone this down. No, she needs to crank it up. And it's just, yeah. But it definitely keeps things balanced. <laughs> wow. Well, so can you tell us everything that, well, we all want to know everything about Unlocked, but I, I have a feeling you're not going to tell us. So can you tell us anything? about Unlocked. Come on, give us, give us some insider information. <laughs> okay, well, Unlocked is, um, is, is a very different book in the series. Um, it, it's, it's sort of two things in one, which is gonna be super exciting. So the first half of it is actually kind of like a really fun sort of guide to the series, but with also things like art and it's sort of, written in some of the characters' voices at times. And so it's not your typical series guide, but it just is kind of like, cause there's been so much, there's been, you know, all of this to keep straight. And so it just sort of is a way of sort of catching readers up in case they are losing track of everything that's going on. And then the second half of the book is the continuation from Legacy, um, which is a novella. And the, the reason why we've done it this way, and when I say novella, it's still gonna end up being like really long, like hundreds of pages. <laughs> um, but the reason why we did it this way is because I realized based on what happened at the end of Legacy, I won't say more because I don't wanna have spoilers, <laughs> but based on what happened at the end of Legacy, I realized that this next portion of the story could be best told if I kind of break a fundamental rule of the series, which is for the other books, we're limited to Sophie's POV. And it's, even though it's third person, we only are in scenes that Sophie is in. And because of what happened at the end of Legacy, I realized that this next little part of the story, I could tell it a lot better if sometimes we could be in a different character's POV. It doesn't make sense to do the whole thing that way, but just this next little piece. And so that's why we're kind of breaking this part off and it's going to be this sort of special novella told with between Sophie and Keith's POVs alternating. Still in third person, but it means we'll get to have moments where Sophie's not there and Keith is. And, and then we have the series guide and all kinds of fun things. And seriously, it is coming together so cool. I can't wait to start showing people the art that has been produced and it's, it's amazing. Like I'm going to hug this book so hard once it's actually done and I don't have to stay up till four in the morning working on it anymore. Well, it sounds incredible. I love that. And I really love when authors play with structure. That's one of my favorite things to look for. I think it's so neat. And one day I want to really play with structure myself. So oh, I'm excited to read it. That's awesome. Yeah, so, it's been really fun. <laughs> oh, well, um, except for the 4 a.m. <laughs> that's not new though so I'm sort of used to it caffeine is my friend <laughs> okay you ready for the uh, lightning round sure bring it on all right cats or dogs cats although I love dogs but cats. <laughs> tacos or pizza Ooh, that's a tough one but I'm gonna say tacos <laughs> yay all right Havenfield or Everglen Another tough one, but all the cool animals are at Havenfield, so I'm going to say Havenfield. <laughs> all right. Telepath or empath? Ooh, okay, so I need to preface this one. I know it's a lightning round, but this question can be construed as a team question. So I am going to, to preface this by saying this is not me choosing a team. This is me choosing what ability I would want to have and empath. Okay. Favorite snack while writing? Um, anything chocolate, but especially lately it's been um, peanut butter M&Ms. Way too many peanut butter M&Ms. <laughs> oh my gosh, Shannon, we are soul sisters. Really? Yeah. Yes. yes. Most of my friends so, don't like peanut butter, butter. Like the same thing. <laughs> We definitely, you need to come to California and we need to hang out. I know, definitely. All right, favorite cupcake flavor? Anything chocolate um, is always my jam, but um, there's this one in a local cupcake shop that's sort of 
chocolate with um, Boston cream pie elements oh. to it. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Okay, so which elephant ability would you want? Um, I would probably want to be a vanisher so I could sneak in around and spy on everybody. <laughs> I'm a writer. Oh. Think of how many stories I would be able to come up with. <laughs> Okay, custard bursts or mellow melt? Ooh, another tough one, but I'm gonna go with custard bursts. All right, the last question. Do you write at home or in public? I write at home, um, mostly because, like I said earlier, I cry when I'm writing, you know, emotional scenes, and sometimes I make myself laugh, and I think that people would worry if I did that in public. They would wonder why that person is just sitting there sobbing at her laptop. <laughs> Well, that is the end of the lightning round. I had so much fun talking to you today and you giving us a glimpse into book nine and I cannot wait to get my hands on it. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And seriously, I am so excited to read the next um, book in your series. It's just, I, I, I was like reaching behind me, like maybe I can grab it and hold it up, but I don't have it yet. It's September 1st, right? Yes, uh -huh. September 1st. September 1st. If you guys watching this have not started this series, now is the perfect time because you can read book one and then book two and then book three by September 1st. Thank you for doing this with me, Jen. And thank you for everyone who watched. And thank you, Comic Con, for letting us be a part of this really fun Comic Con at home thing. This is the least tired I've ever been at Comic Con. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Bye.